My name's Joe Tantarelli, and uh, I'm from the Central Ohio area. Uh, been in the excavating business for almost 40 years, and uh, started out from a sh with a shovel, and uh, wasn't expecting to be handed a shovel when I asked to be an operator. But uh, the boss had a, a situation where he basically told me, he said, Joe, until you learn how to use a shovel well, you'll never be good on a piece of equipment. So he was right. So I started out in the excavating business on a basement crew and very small operator and the grade man. And uh, safety, this was 1976. So safety orientation, uh, no. Uh, so the day started like this. The operator looked at me and said, young man, we hustle here all day, every day. If you ain't a hustler, hit the road because I'm not going to waste my time on you. Because So just a few short sentences on production, right? And uh, not a whole lot about safety talk other than what they had experienced through their careers. So we just fast forward a little bit. Uh, there was a lot of uh, learning the hard way, the school of hard knocks, which is a very bad game plan. Uh, then it progressed into OSHA training. We got a lot of safety training through OSHA, just like almost everybody has. Uh, then we fast forward quite a bit more. And then I also found myself actually uh, <laughs> uh, becoming a safety person. So the last few years of my career, uh, career I, I just started out by uh, my boss coming in one day and saying, hey, we decided to make you safety and production training specialist for the company. And that's pretty much how it ended up. Uh, I, I took it very seriously. Uh, I've always had a deep concern for my fellow employees and their safety mainly because of what happened to me in a trench collapse. Uh, I, I came this close to uh, losing my life and um, I'll never forget what that was like. And uh, there were a lot of things that went on in my mind after that, after si surviving that. And there's, there's multiple reasons why I shouldn't be here talking to you today. But uh, traditional compliance safety was not filling the gap because I had a question after my accident in 1983. Uh, why did I do what I did when I knew better? Because even though safety training wasn't in depth, I had enough experience in seven years on what was dangerous on the job. So for years, I looked for the answer to that question. Why did I do what I do did when I knew better? And uh, it wasn't until I was introduced to human factors at the BWC safety conference in Columbus. And uh, that is what completely changed my outlook on safety and realizing what we were missing and how we could uh, take care of that situation. So uh, it was called, com the, the session was called complacency in the workplace. And uh, the uh, fellow that was doing the training there was from a company called Safe Start. And they were actually at that point in time, just starting to get involved in, in um, human factors involved in what, what we're doing. And on the way home that day, I started realizing that, you know, this is what we're missing in the safety world. And we're still trying to get that word out today. Uh, I still tell that story. It's part of my job. And uh, again, coming this close to losing my life, uh, the impact of the trench collapse, uh, tore the renal artery to my left kidney. I was bleeding internally. Um, we didn't have 911 or cell phones back then. So the, my two laborers that, who I had shoved out of the way, uh, out of harm's way, luckily, came to help me. And uh, they started digging with their hands because we didn't have a shovel. Uh, the shovel was buried in the trench. And I nearly bled to death before we got to the hospital. We didn't call an ambulance. Um, they just threw me in the truck and ran me to the emergency room over six hours in the emergency room uh, or in the uh, uh, emergency surgery. And uh, what had happened was that renal artery stretched and then snapped and I was the, uh, they had to remove my kidney. So a lot of consequences involved in that physically, uh, emotionally, oh my goodness. Um, uh, I had a lot of nightmares and um, it, it, I was able to get over the physical part and one less kidney, a lot of problems with uh, uh, three discs in my lumbar that bulge. Uh, that's actually caused me problems all my career. Uh, and then there were uh, emotional consequences for my family, and that was the hardest part to take, and it still is today. Because uh, 
My waking up with nightmares for approximately three, three and a half years. Uh, my son, Bill, was only five. My daughter, Michelle, was only three and a half. And uh, it caused lasting emotional effects for them and my wife. Uh, when I started telling this story, it was nearly 20 years after my accident. And I had realized after I told that story for the first time that as a family, we never talked about June 6, 1983, when I was I nearly lost my life. When I started telling that story and my family members started coming to my sessions, uh, that's when the floodgates opened. And I started having my family share with me uh, what was going on with them and how it affected them. My son went to one of the sessions with me and on the way home, again, 20 years after that incident, so he was 25 years old, uh, he said, yeah, Dad, you know, I can remember that like it was yesterday, riding on the school bus and wondering if you were going to be okay at work. So a five-year-old kid's main concern should have been whether he had peanut butter or bologna in his lunch pail, not whether or not the old man was going to kick the bucket on the job. Uh, my, my wife you know, went to a session with me in Cleveland and uh, went very well. And on the way home, uh, it was dead silent in the truck, which that's a pretty good sign for somebody who had been married as long as I had been. I must have made Sharon mad. Uh, so I did something you got to be really careful when you do. I opened up a can of worms that sometimes you can't get the lid back on. And I said, hey, hey, baby, what's the matter? And she said, you know, I can't believe you shared the deepest emotions of that day with over 400 strangers because I just realized today that I have never dealt with it. And uh, she said, you don't know this, but for a long time after your accident, if you were five minutes, 10 minutes late coming home from work after that happened, the house was in an uproar. The kids were crying, asking where you were, if you were okay. And I wanted to cry, but I had to be strong for the kids. So that kind of opened my eyes. Now my daughter, uh, being three and a half at the time, she struggles with the emotional effects, but she has no idea why. And that's, that's a tragic thing. Uh, just a couple Christmases ago, um, oh, by the way, the whole family has had some form of uh, uh, anti-anxiety medication prescribed to us. And when we get down to the bottom line, uh, the, the root cause is uh, I rock their worlds when I, brutally explained to them by my actions that it could happen that quickly. Uh, so she was standing at the counter in the kitchen and my wife and I were both in there and, and my wife gingerly suggested, how about your uh, medications? And um, maybe you should get back on it. And my daughter turned around and looked at us and said, what is wrong with us as a family? Why do we need help? to deal with everyday life. And, um, and naturally I broke down because I realized why she was struggling with that. Uh, again, uh, a lot of anxiety in the family and I don't want anyone to ever have to go through that. Now, what I did find out about this incident uh, was years later at that safety conference. And when the guy started mentioning these human factors, we get in a hurry, we get mad, we get tired. Um, We've done it so many times we can do it with our eyes closed. It's kind of like standing on the top step of a ladder to get a job done. Uh, we all step past that step that says this is not a step. So the ladder even screams at us that it's a bad idea, but we do it anyway. And the more we do that and get away with it, the more our subconscious mind starts taking control of the situation. And the next time we get on the top step, our subconscious mind immediately has a pathway already developed and says, go ahead, man, you've done it before. It, so that's kind of what I found out about that. And, and also finding out that when I got involved in safety, we started with the target zero thing, right? And uh, I realized that we were struggling with that target zero because that is a moving target if you want to get right down to it. And what I mean by that is the heat of the moment, uh, these human factors that I just mentioned earlier, rushing, frustration, fatigue, complacency, causes us to make critical errors, eyes not on task, mind not on task, getting into or being in the line of fire and having problems with balance, traction and grip. 
knowing about these doesn't do us a whole lot of good if there's not something that we can do to be proactive about it. And that's when I got a under, deep understanding of what they were talking about. This moving target of target zero, the reason why that target is moving is because those states that I mentioned affect our decision making. And when they affect our decision making, it's in the heat of the moment. So no type of safety training actually shows us when that heat of the moment is going to happen. It's the way the dominoes fall, right? So how can you get target zero when that last little bit, the human factors, is causing the problem in the heat of the moment? And that's when I was introduced to the concepts of later on. Uh, we can work on those habits before they become an issue. And that's where the secret is, the proactive side of safety. Self-triggering on that rushing frustration and fatigue and asking ourselves, why? Why am, I, why am I in a hurry? And is this worth the risk I'm taking? Now, after something bad happens, like nearly bleeding to death and losing your life, the, the answer is always, no, that's not worth, that wasn't worth the risk. But if we can come to the, uh, uh, the ability to work on a habit, to be able to make that decision and ask that question while it's happening, that's when we start seeing the proactive side of safety. So that, was, that would be one thing I would share with others. Self-triggering on the rushing and the frustration and fatigue. Get out of it if you can. If you can't, eyes on task, mind on task. Look for line of fire, balance, traction, and grip issues. Uh, another thing that we can do is analyzing close calls. I mean, close calls, the near miss reporting is so important nowadays because we're realizing a near miss. There's only two things that differentiate a near miss and a fatality, and that's luck, if you want to call it that, and timing. So this is where our, our potential fatalities are hiding in the near miss reporting. So if we can make that uh, non-punitive and, and make it comfortable enough for people to share that they made that mistake, then they're going to be more willing to admit those mistakes. Uh, the next one, um, looking at others. When you look at others and see them coming close to losing their lives or getting hurt on the job, you start waking up and realizing, you know what, I need to get my head back in the game so, in, so I can be prepared for these kind of things. And last but not least, working on habits. If we can get good habits that we work on to the point where our subconscious mind keeps all those good habits, that's the first thing we think about instead of the last thing we think about. Uh, those are the concepts that I like to share with people because this is what we're missing. Uh, and traditional compliance safety is not going to address that part of it. Uh, recently, uh, not long ago in, in a, a little town close to where I live, uh, a guy lost his life. There was a trench shield on the job sitting on top. And ironically, the, the emergency people actually used that trench box to dig that lifeless body out of that trench. Why didn't they use the trench box? Well, this is something I don't get to share a whole lot, but we're doing everything that we can to try to get the employee safe. And we give them all the tools to be able to make that happen. Why isn't it being used? Well, could it be that maybe that trench box wouldn't fit in that application? Now, we've got the new thing out now where uh, stop work authority, right? Hey, guys, I don't feel comfortable about this. Maybe we should regroup and maybe we should call the boss and say, hey, this is not going to work out here. Maybe we should get something else. You know what? That's easier said than done because anybody out on the job is trying to get the job done and get it done efficiently. And fear of admitting that we're not prepared is a situation where we're going to take chances that we wouldn't normally take. Again, those human factors are starting to jump in the situation. This is where we need to do the work to be able to accomplish that goal. And this is something that I would share with anybody to think about that. And not only the person out on the job, but also the people that are supplying those safety procedures. If we don't have the right tools, and if we don't have an adaptable tool to be able to make that situation safer, Many times the employees are going to take it upon themselves to, as for lack of a better term, get her done. And that's where we're starting to see a lot of the problems. And no amount of safety training is going to be able to fix that issue. It's the human factors. And the other very important thing is employers need to start working with those human factors in a non-punitive way. 
In other words, not being in fear of reprimand if we report near misses or if we call in and say, hey, this day's gone bad and it's going to get worse if we don't figure out what to do about it. And those are the, the, the intense details that I like to get across to other people. We've done a great job with traditional compliance safety, but this is the next step and the new step in being able to accomplish those goals. Uh, and that's what I would leave with anybody as, as an employee, not just in excavating, not just in trenching, but in any type of work, any line of work and at home and while we're driving, those states, those human factors are still affecting our decision-making. I'm sure there are people here that have probably been cut off on the freeway by somebody that filled in that little gap you left for safety. Some of us react in ways to where we can self-trigger on the frustration that it immediately happens and back off and say, just let it go. It's not worth the risk. But there are some of us that are tempted or have actually put the chrome horn uh, up against that person just to let them know that we weren't happy with what they did. And by doing that, we open up the doors for a bad thing to happen, right? We've lost our reaction time because we closed that gap because we were mad at those rushers that just cut us off. And what we have is the ability to use those critical air reduction techniques that I mentioned earlier, but that has to happen in the heat of the moment, right? Self-triggering on the rushing or the frustration and backing out of the situation. So those are the things that I, that I would stress more and more making sure that the employer realizes we need to have something that's adaptable to any situation. And also make sure the employees are comfortable, not just telling them to do it, but making them feel comfortable to stop and say, hey, is this worth the risk we're taking today? And every person on the crew and every person that's in charge on that site or in that facility should have the ability to do that without fear of reprimand and without fear of uh, uh, degradation because we've done it. Analyzing close calls. And, and again, this is, is exactly what we're talking about when we're talking about near misses. And I get to see well, probably thousands of people a year. And I just started asking questions. Uh, why don't you do as much near miss reporting? Because nobody's satisfied with their near miss reports. Uh, they know they're not getting all of them. And the two biggest things that I got with that was fear of reprimand, number one. And number two, what the heck is a near miss? Uh, am I supposed to report when I break a nail when, I, when I'm uh, getting in and out of a file cabinet? Well, um, yeah. Uh, it, it, the analyzing close call thing that we call the critical error reduction technique, it I didn't realize how serious the author of Safe Start was when it came to that. But I'll give you an example. I, I uh, Something very simple. I, I, I have to get over to the other side of the room and there's a table that I have to maneuver around. And I've got a card in my hand and I'm going to hand it to one of the people at the table. So I've got my focus on where I'm going and what I'm going to do when I get that card over there. And I accidentally brush across a rounded corner on a plastic table. Now you would look at that and go, why would I report that? Why would I bring that up? Well, if we don't report it, something that we can do in that process is analyze that. Why did I brush that close to that table with my leg? Now, no harm, no foul, no blood, but here's the thing. Whatever caused me, the decision-making or whatever state caused me to get that close to that table without realizing is the same thing that's gonna cause me to get too close to the corner of a workbench, a metal workbench with a sharp corner on it. And there might be solvent or oils or shavings that, be, that would be on that table. And I bump into it, now I break skin. Now I might need stitches. Now there might be some infection issues. Whatever caused me to get too close to the table without realizing it with nothing happening is the same problem that's gonna cause me to get into the corner of that workbench. And now we do have a problem. So yes, we need to evaluate that and analyze that close call and ask us what allowed me to get that close to that table. Was I, was in, was I in a hurry to get over there? Was I so complacent because I'd walked by that table 20 times today and never even came close, right? Uh, am I tired because it's the end of the day? Those kind of things that we analyze that situation, it only takes seconds to do it because we just have to ask ourselves, why did I let that happen? Was it one of those states that affected my decision-making, right? Um, 
these are the kind of things that I, that, that we teach in the process that I'm involved in. I've been doing this for approximately eight years and there's a lot of interactive discussion. So it's wonderful to be able to get a general idea of what's going on out there and what we can do to help uh, with that situation. Uh, also, we struggle with the ability of the supervisors to actually be able to do that and do it efficiently. So we even have a process that we can use to be able to get people involved in uh, supervisor training. And a lot of that gets right down to the bottom line, the littlest thing, communication, communication, and positive communication and positive reinforcement and positive correction. Uh, that's one of the things that I've talked about for quite a while because in the process of being involved in uh, uh, excavating for almost 40 years, I was terrible at communication uh, when I first became a manager, a, a foreman on the job site. And that uh, caused a lot of problems that wouldn't have been there if I would have just learned to use some really good positive communication skills. So that's one thing that I would stress. Uh, and another thing that we can do that we have specific training to be able to help people make sure that the first thing they're thinking about is self-triggering, analyzing close calls, uh, um, excuse me, looking at others and uh, working on habits. But that isn't something that you just do. That's something that has to be trained and has to be top of mind. It's kind of like organized sports. You know, you, you, uh, you start uh, practicing. And the coach has you doing the same thing, drills, right? Over, 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 over. Pretty simple stuff. Why are we repetitively doing it? It's because the repetition is something that's going to get that information stuck in our heads. It's the first thing we think about. And when you get out on the field or whatever sport you're playing, when you need that skill, you don't even have to think about it. It's automatic because it's been ingrained into our subconscious mind. And if, if you talk to the neuroscientists, you realize that subconscious mind, it's what's doing most of the thinking for us in the heat of the moment. So again, the training is extremely important, detailed training. It's the same thing that we do with traditional compliance safety when it comes to com complacency. You know, uh, being so used to it that you don't fear it anymore. That's why we repeat safety training every year, lockout, tag out, uh, caught and struck by, whatever it might be, those things have to be repetitively done to be able to get it stuck up here. So it's the first thing we think about instead of the last thing. Or worse yet, it's the thing that we think about after the incident has happened, the reactive side of safety. So that, that would be something that I would leave you with today is, is, is if you'd like to look into this, we've got some information that we can share with you to be able to do that not only uh, be trained how to use these concepts when it comes to human factors, but also how to help improve the skill level of as the comp company as a whole so that we can get this personal safety lined up with the administrative side of it. Uh, and, and we can get you more information about that later on.